Carlos, how are you? Good to see I'm you. I'm doing good, man. How are you doing? Yeah, doing great. Thanks for making the time, and uh, very, very excited to um, to get a chance to speak with you. So, <laughs> how how did you get started? How what was it about the world of data that pulled you in? Uh, I saw some early interest in GIS. Um, yes. Can you tell us a bit about that. So it is none of it was intentional. It was all serendipitous. I I, all, I, I blame the universe uh, completely and fully for everything that's happened in my life uh, because I have not had anything to do with the planning. This is not. So I originally started, um, when, I, when I went to college, I originally was going to be a civil engineer because that was the, the business that my dad was in and I was going to help him, you know, level up his business and kind of do that whole thing. And um, slowly I kind of gravitated more into environmental engineering because I felt more of an environmental focus and I really wanted to have an impact. And especially at the time, it was, it was the late eighties, early nineties. Um, I felt for me personally, especially being in Miami, it was quite a bit of environmental impact with our local um, marine ecology. And so I felt environmental engineering was gonna be a really good place for me. Um, yes. So I had a professor who was a mentor, a friend of mine, and I have to, I have to give him uh, props for this because I, I was at a quandary, right? I was at a fork in the road where I really loved the science and I really enjoyed the, the, the basic science that I was doing. And the engineering was appealing, especially from a financial standpoint, because for an engineer, you know, obviously there's a lot more potential uh, income there than, than just, you know, normal everyday science is what we know as, as you know, just being basic science, scientific research. And so yeah. I asked him, you know, hey, what do you think I should do, right? Because I'm at this, I want to do, you know, something in the environment, and I'm not sure if I should do environmental engineering mm -hmm. or ecology, right? And he was like, look, I'm not going to tell you what you should pick but pick the one that you would do for the rest of your life for free. And that's the one that you should really uh, consider. That's and great I, advice. I, it, is, it is absolutely sage advice. And, yeah. and uh, you know, take money out of the equation and just simply focus on what brings you fulfillment and happiness. And, uh, and at that moment, I said, you know what? Ecology uh, is, is really appeals to me right now, and this is what I want to do. So I, I went down that path. And I was focusing on marine ecology and, and large marine ecosystems ecology. And so while I was doing my undergrad, I was actually working at the University of Miami at their graduate school for marine and atmospheric science, working on coral reefs and seagrass beds and doing studies out there and, and collecting data, right? Um, and, and just really started getting into that aspect of, you know, science and, and going out and collecting data, analyzing the data, coming up with hypotheses, testing those hypotheses, doing you know, variety of statistical methodologies to figure out if what you're thinking is actually legit is what's happening out in the real world and all that wonderful stuff. And um, eventually worked my way into a full-time job at the University of Miami upon graduating from uh, undergrad. And uh, they sat me down and said, well, you know, you've got a job here if you can figure out this GIS thing. And so they sat me out in front of this Unix machine. That's a good incentive. Um, <laughs> and like four feet worth of manuals, right? Back then it was Arc Info 6. Um, and they said, you know, we've got this massive project in Tampa Bay that we're doing a bunch of ecological modeling for. We're doing fit and transport modeling. We're doing hydrodynamic modeling. And we need an environment to tie it all in together. And this GIS thing is, seems to be the right thing, but nobody else here knows how to operate it. Figure it out. <laughs> you know? I was like, you know, sw sink or swim. Right, sink or swim. Yeah. And, and so that to me was my first data integration project and, and model integration and statistical model in, uh, integration. And so as a result of that, it really became clear to me that I just loved working with data and being able to tell stories from those, from those data assets that I was working with. And so that's what, that's what started this whole journey. Man, that's amazing. That is amazing. Um, and when, when was that? When, when did, did you do that first integration project? So that was back in 95. Um, yeah. And so I worked on that project from 95 to about 97. Um, and so throughout those two years, we were just heavily working on uh, building out those models, doing all the analyses, collecting all the data in we had microcosms that we were collecting data and we were collecting data in, in the ecosystem. We were just doing a whole bunch of things, tying a bunch of things together to come up with, you know, how is this ecosystem going to react if this were to happen or that were to happen and, and that kind of stuff. And uh, so that was fantastic. And then I ended up at the University of Miami uh, running my own GIS lab. 
Um, and so that was very exciting. And I got to do yeah. a wide variety of different projects across the broad spectrum of all kinds of things spatial from, you know, a harmful algal bloom project to how that harmful algal blooms correlate with liver and, and colon cancer. And I mean, just broad spectrum of stuff, working with all kinds of different people. But I think one of the basic things that I really enjoyed about those projects was being of service, right? Because I wasn't, I wasn't really doing things in GIS for GIS sake, right? It wasn't just geographic information science that I was working on. It was really at the service of something larger than that, of something that had potential impact in, in, our, in our social sphere. And so that to me was, was extraordinarily appealing and, and that, I think that was a big driver for the, a lot of the impact that, you know, these projects had on my career. And I love, I love that focus that the, you know, that the tools are just a stepping stone and that the, the outcome that you're seeking is a, is a real world impact. Um, having that from, from early on in your, in your career, I mean, kudos, that's, um, that's amazing. Um, and, and so tell us, how, how did you end up being the chief data officer for the Commonwealth of Virginia? <laughs> All right, so that, that is a somewhat of a long-winded story, but I'll go through it anyway. Um, so after I was at the University of Miami for a few years, um, there was an opportunity to work at uh, NOAA Fisheries um, and, mm -hmm. and be their uh, you know, GIS uh, and, and, and spatial scientist, if you will. And um, so I went there, and I was there for about 15 years, and, and I worked on a variety of different projects, initially at a local scale doing a lot of satellite data integration. So data assets that, you know, were being collected by satellites. So talk about remote sensing, right? I mean, it's wow. not just remote sensing of visual imagery of a, of a location, but we were out there tagging animals, you know, highly migratory species that were traveling the world that were beaming up their data into a satellite. And then we would, they would beam it down to a receiving station and I would write all the applications to bring it in, integrate it, and then visualize it and generate insights. So that was what? pretty cool. And this yeah, is in the thousands, right? This was 99, no, 2001. This is 2001. Bad. Yeah, 2001. Like early days. Yeah, yeah that's way, amazing. way early. I mean, you know, and this is like, I mean, as you know, right, it, it's like none of these things were developed, right? None of these, there was no APIs, no infrastructure. You just had to hard code it all yourself, figure it out, no recipe, which is, I think, the story of my career, right? There's no recipe for anything. You're, you're always on the edge doing something crazy that nobody else has done and you just gotta figure it out. Um, <laughs> great, like I love it. I think, you know, I couldn't ask for anything better. I think if I had to follow a recipe, I'd be bored out of my mind and wouldn't want to right. do it, you know? So, um, so early 2000s, wow. yeah, that was, that was the first project that I did for North Fisheries and since then we evolved on a variety of different okay. things and, and started working more enterprise scale, right? Looking at more mm -hmm. at, at the, and I worked for the Southeast region. So we were, we were headquartered in Miami but we had, you know, four labs across from North Carolina all the way to Texas. So it started to look more like regional scope and how do we integrate our data? I mean, everyone was collecting different pieces of the, of the puzzle. So how do we integrate those data assets to get a much larger view of what's happening out in the real world so we can manage these species better, right? And so going through all those processes and you realize technology is never the issue, right? Yeah. It's always people. People are always the issue. So you really got to work with people and try to build up those relationships. And those are the things that I learned over those years of being in NOAA Fisheries. Now, fast forward 15 years later, um, I then get an opportunity to work in D.C. for the Federal Transit Administration at the U.S. Department of Transportation. And so as a result of all of my enterprise experience working on NOAA's big data project and working on a variety of national initiatives for NOAA Fisheries and working with other folks across NOAA and NOAA, for those who don't know, NOAA is our National Atmospheric and Ocean, uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. We have six different services. So there's the fishery service, the ocean service, satellite service, weather service, and a couple other ancillary services as well. But really it's, you know, everyone has a different piece of the pie and it's being able to look across the different services, which in their own right, they're like agencies of their own, right? And don't really work with each other, but being in environments where you can work across multiple agencies with other scientists and bring data assets together to work on larger scale problems really kind of demonstrates the value of the synergy of data integration yes. and bringing your data assets together and, and making collective holistic uh, views of what's happening in the real world. Because at the end of the day, data, it's just a binary representation of what's happening in the real world, right? And so being yeah. able to translate that back and be able to say, okay, this is what I think is happening in the world. How do I verify that this is my perspective is valid, right? And so you have to integrate data from other places. So 
having that enterprise perspective really set me up to be the chief enterprise architect and the chief data officer for the Federal Transit Administration. So in that scenario, I actually managed the data, uh, the data life cycle from soup to nuts, right? Mm -hmm. All the way through, um, mm -hmm. you know, and so working with the development teams, we had nine different development teams and coming up with this, the data standards that they all have to follow because they're all kind of working in the same, they were all working in the same environment mm -hmm. with the same data source building out their applications to support the business processes, but they were all kind of like, when I got there, it was like the wild, wild west. You know, they all did their own thing yeah. and yeah. we'll figure it out when we get there. And then when you want, so the funny thing is when I came on board, I was also the BI program manager. It was a small agency where we had to wear many hats. But anyway, they, the first thing is like, well, make sense of all these data assets and give us some insight, right? Tell us what's happening with all with the grants that we're offering, with the operations of the organizations that we're managing, all this wonderful stuff. And so I start obviously looking at the data and the first thing you find are data quality issues. Yeah. It's like, well, this is what you have and this is what it looks like and we need to fix it. Well, how can we fix it? Well, we implement these data standards, we implement a process, we do gatekeeper reviews. We, before any developer you know, can implement any code on this system, they have to go through a variety of checkpoints to make sure that their data model is accurate to match the business process that they're modeling. And then you know, the DDL and all that wonderful stuff and so that allowed me to kind of look at the entire thing holistically and say, all right, how do we fix this in a way that doesn't impede the developers from doing their work? Because we, we don't want to stop them. You don't want to hinder them. We want them to continue working. But we want them doing it in a consistent, standardized way that all development teams can adopt. And so that required a few, quite a few months worth of work to put that process together. But at the end of the day, we were able to tie it all in to what I then created or called the data value chain. Right, where, where we start off with the bits and bytes, right? And the, the data assets, the, the data itself, the binary representation of what's happening in the real world. But then it doesn't become information until someone interprets it, right? It takes a human being from some perspective to interpret that data, those bits and bytes, to be able to say, okay, well, this is what this means to me. But the more eyes you have on the more perspectives that you have, or the more domains that are looking at that data, they're gonna have different interpretations, therefore creating more information. Right? But that information doesn't become knowledge until it's assimilated into the organization. Right? You have to understand the mechanisms of patterns and trends that are being represented in that binary data to be able to say, okay, well, this is what this means. This is, what, this is how this is evolving. These are the you know, mechanisms and, and patterns that are associated with this. But then ultimately, it doesn't become intelligence until that knowledge is integrated into the decision-making framework. Someone looks at it, gets the insight, makes a decision, but then ultimately takes an action. Right? If you don't take an action on your decision, then you've done nothing. Right? Yes. So you have to be able to facilitate that action. And so that's where I really got that whole entire piece nailed down because I pretty much controlled the entire scope of that process yeah. and I really kind of illuminated that. So after that, and I know this was a long-winded story, so I apologize. But Man, this, is great. That, this is great. Yeah. That's how I ended up at the Commonwealth of Virginia as their chief data mm -hmm. officer because after having that entire experience, and I was able to control um, the full spectrum of the data life cycle. I was then able to transfer over to state government and then uh, be able to work with them on improving their data posture. And so yeah. that's where uh, I am now. Man, amazing, amazing. A lot of things uh, stood out to me in, in, um, in your background. And one of them was the, the strength. Uh, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, strength of yours to bring people together um, and highlighted by how you approach the beginning of, of projects and the beginning of capability development and the end of, of the project where um, I find that a, a lot of people tend to focus in the middle section, which is kind of like the technical delivery, uh, but, but you seem to also have a knack for, you know, uh, leveraging what other people uh, the, or leveraging the data assets from other parts of the organization and being able to bring those people together for a common cause, do the technical delivery, and then, and then highlight uh, the importance uh, or the value that this new work can create and, and get people to adopt it and, and really uh, drive sort of that last mile of analytics adoption so people can actually get the value. Um, do you agree? Is this an area of focus for you, the, the start and end piece of bringing people together and, and getting people to use the, uh, the new capabilities? And, and um, how has that been for you? Is it a focus? And how did you develop that, that strength? So that, uh, that's a great question. Yes, I absolutely agree with you that the, that the end goal matters because it all starts with why. Mm. Why are we doing this? 
right? And, and if you can let people understand the why behind the how and ultimately the what that's created, then you'll get a lot more buy-in. Um, and those are the things that, you know, I always focus on the why most importantly, because not only is it a driver for a lot of individuals to start to respond to what mm -hmm. you're asking them to do, but it also gives meaning and value to the work that you're doing. Yes, we implement technologies and it's great and we're innovative and we're creative in the, in the processes that we generate and that's all wonderful, but those are means to the end and the end is the value that we're providing either our stakeholders, or our constituents. I mean, I've been in public service now for 19 years. Um, and even back when I was at the University of Miami, I still considered that somewhat of a public service because I was still, you know, at the service of the other sciences that I was working with. So it's, it's about being of service and providing value to those around you. And so if you can start with that why and look at how what you're doing is actually providing that value to individuals way beyond yourself, I think that brings a lot of people on board faster than if you were just start with the basic, well, we're gonna create this solution and this is, you know, it, that's all, a lot of people don't really resonate. I mean, except for the techies. We love yeah. the technology, we wanna be able to jump in. But the reality is, you know, and, and I look at, you know, people process technology, right, all the time. And mm -hmm. technology is like this big, right? Yeah. Process is this big, you know, people. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> that's how much important it is, you know, and that's where you need to focus. And so being able to, you know, bring, and, all of those different individuals, because you don't always, you don't have the entire perspective. And, and if you come into the problem understanding that you have a perspective, but yours isn't the only one, nor is it the most important one, it's just a perspective. And when you bring other people into the mix, you're able to appreciate what their perspectives are and then be able to bring together and create a more robust solution because you now are not just one-sided, you're now looking at multiple points of view that are you know integrated into the larger solution space. Yeah, oh, man, that's that's fantastic. Um, how do you pick the the tasks that will be prioritized or or the data assets to to start working on first? How does that um, how does that happen? Is it is it from the agency? Is it in conversations with with other areas? Um, is it, is it decided at a state level? Uh, what's, what's the process there for, for something to become a, an area of focus? So that's a um, very great question. And I think one of the primary things is in, in, the, in the legislation that I created my position, there was also the mandate to work on an opioid pilot project. And so that was one of the first things, like get on board and you know, the first day I got to the job, work on the opioid pilot project. And thankfully, I had technology partners and agency partners that were already starting to have those discussions and starting to get together on that to be able to just jump on that project and run with it. Uh, but since then, obviously, COVID-19 has been a, a significant mm -hmm. project that we've been dealing with. Um, so it's, it's having conversations with, with state leaders across the board to identify, you know, what are the things that we're most um, impressed upon, right? What are the things that we absolutely have to start dealing with? These large-scale, multidisciplinary, complex problems that aren't very straightforward, that are not easy to deal with, those are the ones that kind of drive the discussion. And then through that process, you know, grow organically. Identify what other data elements and assets we can bring to the table to start, like I said before, painting that larger picture of what, what's happening in the world world and how do we, how do we learn better about how to respond to these large scale issues. Exactly, and and what uh, really stood out to me is is the the similarities with working in a in a large organization where you might have a metric that the organization wants to improve, and some people have the data, other people have the the capabilities to be able to uh, impact that metric, and that yeah, the 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 you know the data function sits kind of like in between. As, as this broker, as somebody who incentivizes, as somebody who brings people together, and in, in such you know, distributed, complex environments, tackling such, um, such complex issues as well, it's, it's, a, it's a big, it's a big um, task, like it's a tall yeah. order. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, right? It's huge. Wow. <laughs> it's huge. It's huge. Yeah, hurting the cats. Um, how, how do you approach the, the I guess, the, the, hurting, the hurting of the cats? Do you have any tips for people um, that, that uh, are in those situations? Um, I find that um, a lot of people, even myself, like I find that I'm, I, don't, I don't give that enough time and enough focus in my, in my day, but it's really such a huge level of impact. Uh, for for the work, um, so do do you have any tips for people that that uh, should be spending more time on it or that could be doing a better job? I I do, um, but it's not a recipe, right? Like n- none of this stuff you can you can write an instruction guide and say this is a step by step playbook of how you need to do this because every organization is different. Um, every organization has a different culture, and culture plays a key role in how mm. willing they are to share data, to do data analytics, to believe the intelligence that you're putting in front of them, and then to act upon it, right? So Mm -hmm. all of those things are really, really, really dependent upon culture. And so the first thing you need to do when you come into these situations is really feel out the organization, get a really good understanding, you know, ground truth yourself in, in how that organization operates. What is its primary culture? What are the, are there any trust issues? You know, what are the relationships within that organization that you need to cultivate to help build up that trust? Because at the end of the day, it's about respect and trust, right? Yeah. If, if individuals don't have respect and trust for each other, then a relationship does not ensue, right? And so those are the primary components of being able to bring people together is to cultivate that respect and trust. And obviously that comes with integrity, right? I mean, you have to have integrity. And we talk about, personal integrity, but you know, that leads to data integrity, right? Making sure that the data assets are fit for purpose and, you know, and data quality and all that stuff, but you can't get there until you have personal integrity and being able to build those relationships. So ultimately, um, you know, feeling out the culture, getting a really good handle on what are the relationships that currently exist that you need to participate in to get a better understanding of how, of the role you as an individual can play as a facilitator and a catalyst, right? And I think that's critical because you are not necessarily the doer of all things. You are yeah. the, the catalyst of these things getting done and, and putting yourself in, in making sure that you're in that mindset of, you know, understanding that it is not 100% up to you. You can only herd the cats, but you can't make the cats do anything, right? Yeah. <laughs> you can, you can kind of just nudge them in different ways, but um, you really have to play the role of a catalyst and a facilitator. So being able to have that understanding is critical. And then obviously, you know, you, you have to look at the big picture, right? And understand what are the driving forces behind that organization. You know, they may list a particular attribute as a KPI, but is it really indicative of the customer's experience? Is it really indicative of success for that organization? And sometimes you have to question those things and be able to bring in alternative KPIs to be able to say, well, you know, you think this is really measuring this, but in reality, it's measuring that. And you really, this is what you're after. And be able, but that means that you have to understand the business. Yeah. Right? You know, you have to, you have to dig deep and be able to truly understand the business itself. You are not a technologist. You use technology, but as a data officer, you are not a technologist. You are a business person who leverages technology to make the business more successful in whatever it is that that business is. So I often tell folks that, you know, data is a business asset, not a technology asset. It's implemented in technology but it really, the value proposition for data is in the business world. And that's where you as a CEO need to really play is that role between business and technology and help facilitate that conversation and help catalyze the right actions that need to take place to move that organization forward. Man, I love, I love that consultative approach of, you know, you, you really kind of like need to get uh, under under the hood of of what what uh, business outcome people are trying to get and understand that and then help them define the best metric to guide them there um, define the type of data that they need so you you're really yeah as you said you really are a business partner um, that has that has a data capability but kind of like a business partner first uh, is oh, yeah. that is that how you see it. Oh, absolutely. Um, you are definitely a business partner. You're there to make sure the success of the, bil- the, the business is, or the organization, let's say, you know, yes. to, to make it more generic. Um, you know, because 
all organizations have different success metrics and being able to understand what drives that organization is critical to you being successful in this role. And oftentimes that sometimes means business process re-engineering. Right? Sometimes you need to dig deep and see what they're doing up and down the chain to come, that either generates poor quality data or missing data or you know they're not collecting the data at all which then impedes their ability to make decisions later on down the road. So you really, you have to be willing to, to understand the business and dig deep into the nitty gritty details of how that business operates. What are the business processes that they're currently using across the broad spectrum of units and organizations within that business to get a better understanding of how it all comes together. And then, and sometimes you actually have to recommend like, you know, you really need to do this differently, but well, we've always done it this way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> this is this is this is where you are now because you've always done it this way and if you want to do something different or you want to get somewhere different you need to do something different and yeah. so being able to to uh persuade those uh <laughs> business managers to to think a little differently and operate a little differently and it, it is painful i mean business process reengineering is not an easy process and, and it's something that, you know, requires a lot of pain and sometimes suffering. And so, you know, being able to explain to them and, and articulate the value of the change in the process and how they're going to get more out of it um, is key. Now, you have to be able to do that. And you have to do that from a business perspective, not a technology perspective. Nobody cares about the bells and whistles that you're going to bring into the company. They want to know what you're producing for them. And that's where you need to focus. So true and fantastic note to end on. Carlos, thank you. Thank you so much, man. This My is pleasure. Like, uh, amazing. This has been amazing. Um, yeah, with the, obviously this, this, um, we, we are um, releasing the video at the moment, but we, we're going to release the, um, uh, the audio in the podcast and uh, I'll, I'll be in touch when that happens. Uh, and man, this has been an absolute blast. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for sharing all your lessons, your insights. Uh, it's, it's been a blast. My pleasure, Felipe. Always. That brings this episode to conclusion. Thank you so much for listening. Please find us on datafuturology.com or on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram as Data Futurology. Also go to datafuturology.com forward slash podcast to find the show notes for this and any other episodes. If you like this episode, it would mean a lot to us if you could leave us a review wherever you listen to our podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode and that it was helpful and valuable for you. Thanks again and see you next time.